coincide with my anniversary here at the church. So it'd be a nice mile marker. Uh, we have a report from the incredible fundraising activities, the mission activities uh, that our young folks have been involved in. Uh, this is an updated report on the bacon lawn sale. Wow, wow, truly amazing. Um, Lorraine would like to say uh, that we got to witness a mini version of the miracle of five loaves and two fishes. A beautiful what would Jesus do uh, moment for he would take some baked goods and some lawn sale items and turn them into $1,038. Wow. <laughs> our children, our young people, yes. So it was 742 from Saturday sale, and that went to the John Graham Shelter and the Haiti Orphanage. And 296 bucks, about $300, will go to the Vermont Flood Relief. So uh, through Abby Pollander, Anne's twin sister, we've uh, made a connection uh, to get that flood relief money to where it is most needed uh, as Abby lives in St. Johnsbury and is connected to aid relief uh, there. So, man, not just from the mouth of babes, but from the leadership of our young people setting the example. <laughs> They're not done. There is a walkathon uh, next Sunday. Also, our outdoor service is also next Sunday. Uh, fairly simple. We'll have a tent set up. Yeah, this way, right? Yeah, uh, or that way. Okay, a <laughs> tent set up. Uh, and some chairs. It'll be sort of an informal outdoor service. Uh, it'll be a great time. We do have two candidates for baptism. So that, yes, that is, uh, is wonderful. And if you are still interested in being uh, baptized, it's not too late. Uh, it just takes a conversation with me. And, um, and then we can get you suited up and ready to get dunked. Uh, I'm a dunker, by the way. Uh, um, in the river there. But if you want to explore baptism between now and Sunday, please reach out to me and, and let me know. And then following the outdoor service, uh, after the benediction, uh, those who are supporting the Children's Walkathon uh, will make our way to Willard's Woods and we'll walk through Willard's Woods. Um, CJ was already sponsored. I have also been sponsored now, uh, but we really want the, the children to get sponsored. So if anyone today hasn't done that. Here is an appeal from our kids themselves. So come on up, Lena and Caroline. Um, I would go to that one, and then Wyatt, make sure that mic is on so we can see you a little better. It's a, not as tall. All righty. We want to remind everyone that our walkathon for the children in the orphanage in Haiti that our church helps support is the only week, next Sunday, August 18th, right after church. Father Board D and two other adults take care of the, the children. They live, study, learn, work, pray, and play together. However, they have had to flee poor Prince and their new and repaired orphanage because of the extreme violence theft and insecurity in Haiti. They lost everything. Father Bordeaux, um, Father Bordeaux and the children live in a much safer place now called Jeremy South of Port Prince. It is hard for them because everything is so very expensive. Father Bordeaux and Miss Anna teach the children up to sixth grade. The children spend two hours a day learning English. Nine students will be Going to a secondary school, this is also very expensive, although very important for their personal future as well as their development, <coughs> development in, of Haiti. So next Sunday, WWJD, Children Walking for Children, we welcome you to join us. Or if you haven't sponsored, we welcome that as well. Next Sunday, right after church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lena, and thank you, Caroline. Children walking for children. You can sponsor folks or join in the walk yourself, but ideally do both, sponsor uh, and walk. Hearts unto the Lord. 
And as we transition into our time of worship, I invite you into some centering breaths with me. Breaths that will bring our hearts and our minds collectively to this place together. To do that, I invite you into three deep centering breaths with me. First, we'll breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. One last time, friends. Breathe in. Breathe out. No matter where you were this weekend, no matter how your morning started, we are here now as one, intentionally making space for the divine in our lives. Divine love, we thank you for the very breath of life, your first gift to us all. And now, Brother Tim, will you usher us into a time of worship? Thank you, Timothy. That was beautiful. Friends, that now brings us to our call to worship in today's service. That is printed in your bulletin, and this morning it will be led by our beloved deacon, Mr. Glenn Simpler. Good morning. <clears throat> Gentle and patient. Careful and persistent. <laughs> In grieving and in praise, God, you are calling through dawn and midday. God, you are calling unexpected and planned. God, you are calling in a still small voice and in power. God, you are calling spontaneous and prepared. God, you are calling willing and protected. God, you are calling. Our God is eager to share with us whatever we are in our journey. May we be diligent to listen to God. Thank you, church. That brings us to our first hymn of the morning, hymn number 98. I know it is a favorite of so many. Hymn number 98, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I invite you to stand if you are able and if you would like to. 
hymn number 98, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let us lift up our voices together, church. church, please remain standing for a word of prayer. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. The azalea bushes are already doing their job. The hydrangeas are already doing their job to point to your love. The crab apple trees in my backyard, the apple tree, the daffodils, the crocuses, the stars, the fireflies, the praying mantis, the crickets, they're all doing their job to point to the beauty and bounty of your creation of nature, and we are to join them. Join with all nature 
in diverse, manifold witness to your love. Divine love, we are seeking you this morning. We are seeking you ever nearer and ever dearer to us. We beseech that your spirit come down into this gorgeous mountain chapel to commune with us, to abide with us. Let us feel this atmosphere drenched with your holy peace and your holy joy and your holy love. Not only do we invite the Spirit to come among us, we invite the Spirit already inside of us to emanate in such a way that we brighten the path of those around us. Lord, we'll be grateful. We'll be grateful if you visit us in a special way this morning. We'll be grateful if you commune with us ever so nearly and ever so dearly. Lord, we ask these things in the way that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. lead us in prayers. <laughs> Let's pray, church. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your Spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, we come to you now almost like little children, often carrying things that are too heavy for us to carry. We come to you because you tell us in Holy Scripture to cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Lord, we've come to do just that this morning. We lift up Joanne and Bruce and Jonathan, his life, his friends, his family, we lift up Max and Henry Orvis and the children in Haiti. 
Lord, we ask that where there is brokenness of body, that you provide wholeness and healing. Where there is heaviness of spirit, Lord, we ask that you gladden the heart. And Lord, where there is chaos in our minds, busy and racing, we ask for your peace that passes all understanding to quiet our minds, still our minds, so that we might focus on noble and lovely things. And Lord, right now, I come against the spirit of division that is in the Church of Jesus Christ and in the Lincoln Church, as with all churches. Lord, it's not that churches can't have division or complication or ill will. It's how we respond to it. We are not immune, as is the rest of the world, but our response to it ought to be shaped by love incarnate, ought to be shaped by the fruit of the Spirit. And so, Lord, I rebuke it now. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ that we will live up to that noble creed, to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love our enemies, to come with open ears and open hearts, to seek first to understand, and then to be understood. In our tradition, they say that we shall know they are Christians by their love. Help our love to rise to the fore again and be the thing that folks most encounter in our church and in our lives. I believe that the spirit of love is more powerful than the spirit of division. I believe that the Prince of Peace is more powerful than any spirit, especially one that would seek to divide. And so I invoke the Prince of Peace this morning. I invoke love divine this morning to come down and saturate our atmosphere with the grace and meekness and forgiveness that is to shape our tradition. They're not mere guidelines. They are a way of being. Help us to lean into those precious fruits. We ask this in the name of love incarnate who we call Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, that brings us to our next hymn of the service, hymn number 105, 105, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. I invite you to stand if you are able and if you would like to, invite you to stand. Number 105, Grace That Is Greater Than Our Sin. Friends, let's lift up our voices together.
Let's do that chorus a cappella, friends, just the chorus. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is Thank you. Please be seated. It's God's grace, friends, not ours. God's grace to dispense freely and to always. We now have a scripture reading uh, in today's service. It comes from the book of Daniel this morning, and that will be led by our beloved deacon, Miss Kathy Mickelson. And Kathy, I made a slight error. Uh, it's chapter 3, yep, yeah, but got to start at verse 13. So we'll read expeditiously, but 13, starting at 13. 13 through 30? Yes, ma'am. Nope. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I'll start with 13, you come in with 14 and so forth. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and that you will not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, Lyre, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary. And ordered some of the strongest guards in the army to find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace for blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because of the king's command was urgent, and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lived in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? It is the king, true, O king. He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then appeared. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors 
gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants to trust in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <clears throat> excuse me, shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Join me. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. <clears throat> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, church, for winding your way through that story. We've now arrived at the preaching moment, that sacred Kairos moment, time out of time, where we knock on the pearly gates of heaven and beckon a word from the Lord to come down. Will you pray with me? Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> How many love this story about the three Wyatt hand went up immediately? The Hebrew boys being thrown into the fiery furnace, the mystery of that fourth figure, it's amazing. But this morning, I'm less moved by what the men did and am incredibly curious and moved about what they said. You know, when I was hobnobbing in the New York Episcopal circles before I was called to be pastor here, there was this experience of not recognizing hardly any of the hymns. Also, I know we had a blood-centric hymn this morning. They sneak in from time to time, forgive me. But in this cardinal parish, as they called it, of St. James Episcopal Church on Madison Avenue in New York City, they would sing a, a favorite hymn of mine, but I wouldn't recognize it because it would be so very different. The most startling example was, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. And at St. James, it went something like this. Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw from me, whether shall I go? But when I was a kid, growing up in my mama's church in the South, a missionary Baptist church, black church in Perry, Florida, where I was born, a deacon off to the side, at some point unprompted in the service, would lift up his head and sing, but it sounded more like this.
tell me where shall I go? There was a desperation to the song. There was a deep guttural moan and wail attempted to be captured in the melody of that song. It was a desperation that you could almost taste. What we had been through as a people and what my mother had been through as a family shaped a kind of fire-tested faith. We knew we could not be where we were as a people and as a family without God. In the black church, you would say, ain't nobody but God. And as a kid, I, I would watch the elders of the church get up and, and give a testimony about how God had moved in their lives last week or 10 years ago or that very morning. And even if, as children, our divinity detector wasn't that well trained, we could witness the move of God in their lives. And our faith grew from hearing the testimonies of our mother and grandmothers, the deacons, the trustees, the aunts and the uncles. Scripture says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So our faith would grow by listening to the testimonies from the elders of our church. We knew that if God could do it for them, then one day God could do it for us. It produced in us, our children, a kind of fire-tested faith before we ever got near a fiery furnace in our own lives. But one day that fiery furnace came, as it will for all of us. And our faith, my faith, would be tested. I submit, Lincoln, that we're in a period in human history where we don't need fair weather believers. We're in a period right now, I believe, where the world could benefit from some folks with fire-tested faith. Has your faith been hard-fought and hard-won? I know mine has. My current relationship with God features some battles in my life where I only had God to depend on. Nothing else in this world offered me hope or comfort except God and God's people. Am I the only one in here who knows a little bit about that kind of faith? My faith is hard fought and hard won. God has made God's self real to me. The veil has been lifted and I can't go back. I have entered the but if not stage of my faith. The but if not stage of my faith. What is the but if not stage of faith? Let's draw our attention back to that story from our scripture today that Kathy led us. You remember the story? King Nebuchadnezzar built this golden statue that was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. For our architect friends, it's an obelisk. Huge golden structure just wakes up one day to build this pagan idol and force everyone in the land to bow down before that idol or they would be immediately killed in one of the most excruciating ways being consumed in a fiery furnace. 
And sure enough, everyone who heard the decree fell down and worshipped this idol. And Nebuchadnezzar was so thrilled and so pleased. But then someone spotted some folks not bowing. Spotted some folks who were standing strong and proud. And it says the Chaldeans, those special soothsayers, they noticed these Jewish men. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the music shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. But there are certain believers, certain people of faith, certain children of God, certain workers of divine love who you have appointed over the affairs of your province of Babylon and they pay no heed to you, O king. Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow. They will not serve your gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that the three men be brought in. So they brought him in. And King Nebuchadnezzar is like, okay, well, once they feel the heat of the fire, they'll change their minds. He wasn't sure that their faith had been fire tested already. So he brings the men in and he says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the music, you shall fall down and worship the statue. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. Listen to what these men said. They essentially said, hold up, king, you, you don't even have to go through your whole villain speech. I, I can just stop you right there. Because it's not about what we're going to say. It's about what we're already prepared to do. And there's nothing you can do to shake that within us. They said, O king, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace and out of your hand, then let our God deliver us. But then verse 18, church. But if not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we still will not serve your gods or worship this golden statue. But, but if not, As you read in the story, they get thrown in. The fourth angel, or the fourth member, an angel is there. They come out completely unharmed. Nebuchadnezzar has an epiphany and props up the God of Israel as the God of Babylon for that short time. But if not, be it known to you that we still won't serve. That's some serious faith. It's a bit ironic because if God doesn't deliver them, they burn up in the fire, and then there's no real way to see if they wouldn't bow after that because, well, they'd be dead. But it's not, again, their actions. It's what they're saying. They're saying right here and right now, before we even go in, whether we get delivered or not, in no way changes our faith. 
They are saying this little ego test of getting people to deny their relationship to God in no way changes my relationship to the God I've always known. In no way changes who I know God to be. It in no way changes all that God has walked me through. In no way changes what God has brought me through. Your little test, whatever the current fad or trend is in this world, does not affect my love of God, which is rooted in another world. Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, don't you know that this world is not our home and we're just a pastor? through don't you know that Amen. your little ego test with bowing before this little statue does nothing to change who I know God to be so if our God delivers us we praise God but if not we praise God. Amen. All right. Man, if we had believers today with faith like that. Do we have believers today with faith like that? In Sunday school, we were taught that these were Hebrew boys. Raise your hand if you have heard that before. The Hebrew boys, the Hebrew teenagers, the youth. They're not friends. <laughs> they're not teenagers. They're not young. Nowhere in the biblical text does it describe them as young. In fact, in verse 12, it says that they were certain Jews who had been appointed over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. So they were Jewish leaders in authority. And not that children can't have rock-solid faith, but this kind of fire-tested faith suggests to me that these three leaders had been through some stuff, had seen a few trials or tribulations, maybe had struggled with addiction that God brought them out of, or had stayed up late at night praying for their child to be safe, or had stared at an empty table with no food until God's people showed up, or had been sick in the hospital with the doctor saying, there's nothing more we can do, but got healed somehow anyway, uh, had been fired from their job with no way to feed their family until the children of God showed up, had been ostracized, by others for looking different or loving different or living different but heard God's people say that you're loved because of who you are and not despite who you are. Maybe they had been through some stuff. Amen. Maybe they didn't just show up to the fire that day with no personal connection to the God they were being asked to deny. C call me crazy, but it sounds to me that these Hebrew men had to battle some stuff to arrive at their but if not faith. What boldness. <laughs> what trust in God. What faith. Whatever worldly trend or fad is cropping up out there, it does not change who I know God to be. You see, Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue was brand new, but their faith wasn't. He had just erected this golden statue, but these three men had been walking with God far longer. The 90 feet by 9 structure was new, but their faith wasn't. The stones that was used to build it was new, but their faith wasn't. The golden plating was very new. And even the fire that was just lit was new, but their faith wasn't. What boldness. What trust in God? What faith? Friends, I, I know it can get tough out there. And I know that the world is on fire. And it can be very hard to see God moving. But our trust still lies in an almighty God. 
And we can pray that God continues to call God's people to be instruments of peace. And and we can pray for the wars to stop and the bloodshed to cease. We can pray that countries respect sovereign borders and kids get the good uh, food and medicine that they need. We can pray that families escaping violence and coming to these borders will be treated like children of God, made in God's image, just like us. We can pray hard and work toward those things. But let's not allow the world's calamity to distort who we know God to be. Let's not allow the current conflagration of the world to give us amnesia about all the ways God has shown up in our own lives. Let's show that our faith is fire-tested. Lord, we pray that you heal the world today, this morning, right now. But if not, we'll still love you and praise you. Our faith is not dependent on the latest heartbreak of the world. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And since the world didn't give it to me, the world can't take it away. My love is not dependent on whether folks deserve it or not. My inner peace is not dependent on the state of affairs around me. My hope is built of nothing less than Jesus' love, God's love, and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for sunnier days ahead, but if not, you are still our God, and we are still your people. Amen. Friends, that brings us to our last short hymn of this morning. But before we dive right in, if I can invite us into the briefest of moments, honoring the tradition of our Quaker friends, Just a brief moment of silence. Holy silence. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn is on the back of your bulletin, a beautiful short love letter to God. We're going to sing it three times. It's going to go pretty quickly. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, again, on the back of your bulletin. We'll sing it three times through, and then we'll have the benediction, and we'll be done.
No surprise, last time acapella through, let us, in the spirit of unity, as followers of love and spiritual practitioners that point toward the light, let's lift this up to this noble idea of love. I love you, Lord.